Um, and in this lecture, I'm going to give a little overview uh, and a very brief history of the R statistical programming environment. So uh, the very first question I think is most obvious, is which is what is R? Uh, and the answer is actually quite simple. Uh, it's basically R is a dialect of S. Okay, so that leads to the next logical question, which is what is S? So S uh, was a language, or is a language, that was developed by John Chambers uh, and at the now defunct Bell Labs. Um, and it was initiated in 1976 as an internal statistical analysis environment, so the, an environment that the people at Bell Labs could use to analyze data. Um, and initially it was um, implemented as a series of Fortran libraries to kind of implement routines that were tedious to have to do over and over again. So there were Fortran libraries to repeat these statistical routines. Um, early versions of the language uh, uh, did not contain functions for statistical modeling. Uh, that did not come until roughly version 3 of the language. Uh, so in 1988, the system was rewritten in the C language uh, and to make it more portable across systems. Uh, and it began to resemble the system that we have today. So this was version 3. And there was a seminal book uh, the, called The Statistical Models in S, uh, written by John Chambers and Trevor Hasty, sometimes referred to as the White Book. And that documents the, the, all the statistical analysis functionality that came into the version that version of the language. Version four of the S language was released in 1998, and its version it's the version that we more or less use today. Um, the book Programming with Data, which is a reference for this course, uh, is written by John Chambers, uh, sometimes called the Green Book, uh, and it documents uh, version four of the S language. So. R is a implementation of the S language that was originally developed in Bell Labs. So just a little bit more history here. In 1993, Bell Labs gave a corporation called StatSci, uh, which became Insightful Corporation, an, ex an exclusive license to develop and sell the S language. Uh, in 2004, Insightful purchased uh, the, uh, the S language whole, um, completely from Illucent. Uh, so Bell Labs became Lucent Technology uh, for $2 million uh, and became the current owner. Uh, in 2006, Alcatel purchased Lucent Technologies, and, Alcal and it's now called Alcatel Lucent. Um, uh, so Insightful developed the product, uh, which was an implementation of the S language under the product name S+, uh, and it built a, n a number of fancy features into it, for example, graphical user interfaces and all kinds of uh, nice tools. Um, and that's, so that's where the plus uh, comes from in S+. Uh, in 2008, the Insightful Corporation was acquired by a company called Tibco for $25 million, and that's more or less where it stands. Um, Tibco st still develops S+, uh, although in a, a variety of different types of business analytic type products, um, and, uh, and it continues to this day. So you can see the history of the language is a little bit tortured because of the various um, corporate acquisitions, uh, but it still survives to this day. Um, the basic fundamentals of the S language um, have not really changed since 1998, um, and the, the language that existed in 1998 looks more or less like we like what we use today, at least superficially. Um, and it's worth noting that in 1998, S, the S language won the Association for Computing Machinery's Software System Award, a very prestigious honor. So um, in a document called The Stages and the Evolution of S, John Chambers, uh, who was the original writer of the S language, the original creator, uh, kind of laid out his key principle with designing the S language. Uh, and it's very important, I think, to, to see this, which is that basically um, they wanted to create an interactive environment where you didn't have to think of themselves as programming. right? Uh, then he says, then as the needs became clear and their sophistication increased, that you should be able to slide gradually into programming when the language and system aspects would become more important. So the basic idea is, uh, behind the S language and, uh, and then later the R language is that people would enter the language in an interactive environment where they could use the, la the environment without knowing about any sort of programming or without having to know a uh, very detailed aspects of the language. So they could use the environment to look at data, to add, do basic analyses. Uh, and then when the environment, when they kind of outgrew their environment, then they could get into programming. Uh, they could get into learning the language aspects and learning to develop their own tools. Uh, and, the, and the system would very kind of, would, would promote the kind of transition from user to programmer. And so that was the basic philosophy of the S language. So that's enough about S. Uh, let's go back to R. Uh, so what is R about? So basically, R is a relatively recent development. Uh, in 1991, it was created in New Zealand by two gentlemen named uh, Rossi Haka and Robert Gentleman. Um, so, and they talked about their experience developing R in a, in a paper uh, written, published in 1996 in the Journal of Computational and Graphical Statistics. Uh, in 1993, the first announcement of R was made to the public. Uh, in 1995, uh, Martin Meckler, 
uh, convince Ross and Robert to, to use to license R under the GNU General Public License. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And, and that made R uh, what we call free software. Um, in 1996, a mailing list was developed. So there's two main mailing lists. Uh, there's called, one called R Help, which is a general uh, mailing list for questions, and R Devel, which is a more uh, specific mailing list for people who are doing development work in R. Um, in 1997, uh, the, what's called the R Core Group was formed, uh, and these contained a lot of this contained a lot of the same people uh, from the S Plus who developed S Plus, um, and the Core Group basically controls the source code for R. So this, for the primary source code for R uh, can only be modified by members of the R Core Group. However, a number of out, people who are not in the Core Group have suggested changes to R, and they have been accepted by the Core Group. So some of the features of R, uh, the first one, which is important to kind of back in the old days when people were still using S+, uh, but the syntax is very similar to S, uh, which made it easy for S+, plus users to switch over. This feature isn't quite so relevant today, where most people generally go to R directly. Uh, the semantics are superficially similar to S, uh, in that it looks like it's S, but in reality are quite different, so we'll talk more about this in, in a future lecture. Uh, one of the main benefits of R is that it runs on pretty much any standard computing platform or operating system. Uh, Mac, Windows, Linux, whatever you want, even on your PlayStation 3. Um, and there are frequent releases, so there are annual major releases, uh, and often there are bug fix releases in between. So there's very active development going on, and so things are happening. Um, the software, the core software of R is actually quite lean. Um, its functionality is divided into modular packages, so you don't have to uh, download and install a massive piece of software, uh, whereas you can download a very small piece of fundamental core kind of functions and then add things on as you need them. So um, its graphics capabilities are very sophisticated and give the user a lot of control over how graphics are are, are created, uh, and in my opinion are better than most stat packages. It might even be the best uh, for the most, kind of a general purpose statistical package. Um, it's very useful for interactive work, as I said before, but it contains this powerful programming language uh, for developing new tools, so it e eases the transition from the user to the programmer. And fundamentally, actually, for a language like this, uh, is that there's a very active and vibrant user community. So the mailing lists like R Help and R Devel are very active. There's many uh, posts per day, uh, and all, there's also a series uh, on Stack Overflow where, where questions can be answered. So the, the user community is 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 one of the most interesting aspects of R. It's where all the R packages come from, and it creates a lot of uh, kind of interesting fun, um, features. Um, of course, one of the probably the most critical feature of R is that it's free, uh, both in the sense of free beer and the sense of speech. So what I mean by that is that it doesn't cost any money, so you can download the entire uh, software from uh, from the web, um, and also it's free software. So I'm going to divert for a second to talk a little bit about free software. So with free software, there are four basic principles, right? You have four basic freedoms uh, that you have. The freedom zero is the freedom to run the program for any purpose. So you don't need there's no restrictions on how you can run the program, or when you can run the program, or what you can or cannot do with it. Uh, freedom one is the freedom to study how the program works and adapt it to your needs. So this happens almost every day, um, which is that you can look at the source code for R itself. Uh, you can make changes to it if you want. You can uh, improve it or make a better version of it. You can sell uh, changes to it if you want. You can do. You can modify the program any way you want and adapt it to your needs. Of course, so you can look at the source code for this to get freedom one. Freedom two is that you have the freedom to redistribute copies um, so you can help your neighbor. And so the idea is that you can give copies to other people, you can sell copies, you can do whatever you want with it. And lastly, you have the freedom to improve the program uh, and release your improvements to the public so the whole community benefits. So this is freedom three. Um, and the idea is that when people uh, make changes to the program, they can release them to the public so that everyone gets those changes. Uh, and so these basic freedoms are outlined by the Free Software Foundation. Uh, you can see the more about it at their website there. So there are a couple drawbacks of R. I won't go through all of them, and probably other people have many other complaints. Uh, but there's some basic uh, uh, drawbacks, which are one is that it's essentially based on 40-year-old technology. Um, so the original S language was developed in the 70s, um, ha was based on a, a couple of principles, and the, the basic ideas have not changed too much. Uh, since then. And so as one of the results of that, for example, is that there's little built-in support for dynamic or 3D graphics. Um, but things have improved uh, greatly in that, on that front since the old days, and there's a lot of interesting tools now and packages for doing dynamic and 3D graphics. Um, 
Another drawback of R that I, I hear a lot about is that the functionality is based on consumer demand and basically user contributions. Um, so if no one feels like implementing your favorite method, then that's your job to do. And so you can't, there's no corporation, there's no company that you can complain to, there's no helpline that you can call to say that to demand a specific implementation or a specific feature. If the feature is not there, then you have to build it, uh, or at least you can pay someone to build it. Um, another drawback, which is a little bit more technical, um, is that the objects that you manipulate in R have to be stored in the physical memory of the computer. And so if the object is bigger than the physical memory of the computer, then you can't load it into memory. And then therefore you can't do something in R with that object. Um, so there have been a lot of advancements to deal with this too, both in the R uh, language and also just in the hardware side, there are computers now you can, that you can buy with tremendous amounts of memory. And so some of those problems have been resolved uh, just by kind of improvements in technology. But nevertheless, uh, as we enter the kind of big data era where you have larger and larger data sets, the, the model of loading objects into physical memory uh, can be a limitation. Uh, and finally, I'll just say that R is not ideal for all possible situations. Uh, and so many people, I think, in a way, this is a good thing. They have very high expectations for R. They expect it to be able to do everything, um, uh, but it doesn't do everything. And so you, you should go into this knowing that fact. So the basic R system is divided into two, we can think of two conceptual parts. Uh, there's the base R system that you download from the, a CRAN, which is the Comprehensive R Archive Network, and that's kind of the, the go-to place for all things R. Um, and then there's kind of everything else. And so um, the base system contains uh, what's called the base package, which has all the kind of low-level fundamental functions that you need to run the R system. Um, and then there are other packages contained in the base system, uh, which includes, for example, utils, stats, data sets, graphics, um, and a bunch of other packages that are kind of fundamental packages that more or less everyone might use. Um, and then there are a series of recommended packages, um, so boot for bootstrap, class for classification, cluster, code tools, foreign, uh, and a variety of other packages. These are uh, the commonly used packages, they may not be critical packages, but they're commonly used by many people. So all of these packages come with um, this, the base R system that you download from CRAN. Now, but there's much more than this, obviously, and on the on CRAN, there are right now there are about 4,000 packages that have been developed by users and programmers all around the world. These packages are user contributed; they're not controlled by the R core, um, and they are uploaded to CRAN uh, on a every day on a periodic basis. Um, and the and CRAN has a has a number of um, restrictions and standards that have to be met in order to get a package onto CRAN. So one of the nice things about CRAN is that there that the packages that you download uh, have to meet a certain level of quality. Uh, and so there has to be, for example, there has to be documentation for all of the functions that uh, are in the package, um, and there has to be, and they have to make sure that they pass a certain number of tests. So, so CRAN has 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 a lot of different packages uh, written by users, and the number is really increasing every day. So it's very exciting to see all these packages on CRAN, and there and to see new ones come up every day. Uh, there are also packages associated with the Bioconductor project, which is a package, uh, which is a project um, designed to uh, implement our software for kind of genomic and kind of bio biological data analysis. Um, and of course, there are also all their packages made that people make available on their personal websites. Uh, and there's really no reliable way to keep track of how many packages are available in this fashion. So there's really thousands of packages out there uh, written by people uh, that you can discover and use uh, to analyze data. So there are a couple of documents that you can find on the R website uh, as you're learning to use R. You may want to flip through some of these. Uh, one is uh, an introduction to R, which is a relatively long PDF document now that kind of goes through the basics of um, how to use R, how to use the language. Uh, there's the Writing R Extensions Manual, which is really only uh, useful to read if you're thinking of developing R packages, uh, which are these R these extensions to the main R system. Uh, the R Data Import and Export Manual, which is useful for getting R data into R in the various different ways. Um, the R installation and administration manual is, is most useful if you want to build R from the source code, and I'll talk about that in another video. Um, and then the R internals manual is, uh, is a really technical document for how R is designed, how R uh, is implemented at a very low level, uh, and it's not really for the faint of heart. Uh, but if you're that kind of a person um, who wants to know how R works at a very, very low level, uh, this is the document for you. 
So uh, I'm just going to end here with a couple of texts that are kind of standard or classic texts in this area. Um, of course, the books by John Chambers, Software for Data Analysis uh, and Programming with Data, both published by Springer. Um, and then there's um, two books by Bill Venables and Brian Ripley. One is called Modern Applied Statistics with S, uh, and another one's called S Programming. Although they have the the they talk about S in the title, these books are, all, are both very relevant for R programming too. Um, uh, there's a book by Pinheiro and Bates, which is Mixed Effects Models in S and S Plus. That's also quite useful um, uh, for R programmers too. And finally, Paul Morell, who designed the R graphics system, uh, has written a book called R Graphics, uh, and actually it's currently in its second edition right now. So um, a couple other resources. One is that Springer, the publisher Springer, has a series of books called Use R, which is, um, which is a, a, a lot of very kind of relatively short books on how to use R for different types of topics, different application areas. And this is quite a nice series of books that you may be interested in. Uh, and there may be a book written for your particular area of application. Uh, and there's a longer list of books uh, on the R website. So that was a brief overview of R and the history of how it kind of came to be. Um, and starting with the next video, uh, I'll start talking about the details of the R programming language and how we can use it to analyze data. 